the stuff that maybe he didn't have it in him. Stop it, Martha. Like hell I will. You see, George didn't have much push. He wasn't particularly aggressive. In fact, he was sort of a flop. A great big fat flop. Stop it, stop it Martha. The riddle of truth and illusion. An aging couple's abusive wrath repeats through a vicious cycle of twisted games. Mike Nichols' directional debut, Who is Afraid of Virginia Woolf, invites us into the misery of a damaged marriage. It's an alienating piece that presents us with both reality and illusion, yet they are intertwined in such a way where they are both inseparable. It becomes a labyrinth of suffering. It's a vicious thing. Martha and George play games that begin as wordplay and turn into emotional warfare. They drag their house guests, young couple Nick and Honey, then proceed to speak to each other with deliberate cruelty. The secrets of both couples are laid bare and illusions are viciously exposed. Based on the play by Edward Albee, which first staged on Broadway at the Billy Rose Theatre in October of 1962, critics showered the production with praise, but some mainstream reviewers were shocked by the profanity and sexual themes. For its film adaptation, the brutal dialogue and controversial tone were unimaginable on screen in an era when Hollywood production still largely reflected the idolised vision of studio founders. The plot centres on a bitter, ageing couple, with the help of alcohol, who use their young house guests to fuel anguish and emotional pain towards each other over the course of a distressing night. Arthur, oh, what do you want? I wouldn't go on with this if I were you. Oh, you wouldn't, would you? Would you not? You've already sprung a leak about you know what. What? What? About the sprout, the little bugger, our son. If you start in on this other business, Martha, I warn you. I stand warned. Do we really have to go through all this? So anyway, I'm... Throughout Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Albie sets traps of truth that later spring upon the unsuspecting viewer as illusions. But who can be certain about that? Uncertainty arises mainly because the secrets revealed are never confirmed but linger. There's always some air of truth hidden in each lie. It's a facade deeply rooted in the avoidance of reality. George's harrowing tale of the boy who had killed his mother with a shotgun becomes far more disturbing the more details emerge during the night. It's in suggestion that is most sinister. The film hints that George is possibly the boy from the asylum, but this has never given closure. We're constantly worried if George was involved in the death of his mother and father. His attempts on Martha's life, unfortunately a crude joke conveying what he'd like to do, is followed later when he actually does something vicious like strangle her. It's unsettling and leaves you concerned for what he might do next. It's a brilliant performance by Richard Burton who captures the essence of a pitiful man who could blow at any moment. The abuse he tolerates from Martha honestly makes you emphasise for his struggle. The monologue itself is delivered with perfection. It's shocking and devastates you. But it was the grandest day of my youth. The sarcastic tone of the film constantly reminds the audience that what may at first glance be taken literally could be quite metaphorical, or just a downright lie. George and Martha's witty remarks leave us wondering whether or not each situation is real. They would rather indulge in games and publicly humiliate each other than confront their alienated situation. The burden of failure is what descends to illusion, in George's case not living up to promised expectations of running the history department or Martha being unable to bear children. The house being of poor condition, clothing and glasses scattered about, alludes to Martha's failed duties as a housewife. The confrontation near the end of Act 2 in the parking lot seems like a last chance to reconcile and breach these illusions. To me, this is the most dramatic moment of the film, and Elizabeth Taylor shines here. Both parties truly don't believe each other, maybe because they themselves cannot distinguish reality from fiction anymore. Here is a couple lines I found to be quite profound. You can stand it. I cannot stand it. You can stand it. You married me for it. That's a desperately sick lie. Don't you know it even yet? I looked at you tonight and you weren't there. Mommy snapped. And, and I'm going to howl it out. And I'm not going to give a damn what I do when I'm going to make the biggest goddamn explosion you've ever heard. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf has no easy answers. The title itself refers to the fear of living a life without illusions, reality representing the big bad wolf. 
No answer is direct, and as such, all lie in ambiguity. George exposes the marriage of Nick and Honey to being something rather dishonest. Nick evidently married Honey for her father's wealth and pregnancy. It's heavily suggested that Honey takes pills to avoid having children, as she puts it, doesn't want to be hurt. Does this refer to the physical pain of pregnancy, or something far more selfish? One major similarity between the couples appears in the form of destination. Nick and Honey are bound to the same toxic fate as George and Martha's marriage. Honey will most likely never bear children. Nick's perceived promising signs of running the school department someday will ultimately fade away as they did for George. When George offers advice on how the place is much like quicksand, Nick ignores, thus undoubtedly setting in motion a cycle of misery for the future. Perhaps the biggest illusion of all is the imaginary son. It's a riddle with no answer. What caused George and Martha to create the child? Was it a refuge from reality? We may never know. Once the exorcism of the child is done, everything changes. The death of the phantom child confronts the characters with the reality of their lives. The last moments of the film are in stark contrast to the first. The sharp, cruel language shifts. The sharp-tongued George of previous scenes is now gentle and tender. The vulgar Martha now seems frail. Illusions are shattered and stripped bare. The song Who is Afraid of Virginia Woolf becomes a lullaby that seemingly soothes Martha who is afraid to live a life without illusions. Truth and illusion are intertwined in such a way within Virginia Woolf that one cannot possibly separate fact from fiction. It's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Only the death of a figment child can purge this fantasy away and perhaps uplift their suffering.